ऑन पर करना भी नहीं पड़ेगा so far the first session uh, went into our history in a little detail it also went into two basic prayers yatha ashen and it went into the formulation of the kasti prayer which was done by a great chief priest of the sasanian dynasty who was between he was in the reign of shapur the second who ruled between 309 and 379 and last time session was a session where we had to come down to the nitty gritty follow the book very carefully try and understand avestan words i had indicated that we are all part of the great indo european group of languages so that you have fortunately for us in the avestan several words some of them key words which have uh, echoes in modern languages such as english gujarati hindi which are all part of the indo european group and on the last occasion we had started with the first sermon of zoraster which was contained in one chapter of the yajashni which is chapter 30 30 very quick brief recap what he tells us here is that each must decide for himself this is basic just as the two spirits who were created by god at the beginning of time had to decide for themselves he emphasizes that they are equal in every respect and that one chose morally correctly one chose morally incorrectly and the origin of evil therefore is ascribed to wrong moral choice this was first forcefully put forward after which what was important was that you were told that the path of truth which is the path of asha is a very difficult path it is like going through a molten metal test it's very beautifully put ayanga if you remember and you will ultimately emerge successful just as those who do not use their consciences will ultimately end up in woe now in brief this is what we were told last time today we move on to the great sermon now why do we call it great great because its opening words tell us that he is now speaking to a much larger gathering because he is now talking to not merely the men who are around him if you remember he used the expression narem narem shvakshe tanuya decide for yourselves he is now speaking to persons who have come not only from the immediate vicinity but those who have come from afar and the important thing that he is going to tell us is that this is now post revelation so if we may start straight away by coming to yasna ha 45.1 which you all will find at uh, all, all of you will find at page 229 now he begins by saying and the expression used constantly is explanation at pravaksha i am going to explain to you the very first words and he says all of you please listen those who have come from near and those who have come from afar that's in the very first lines and he tells us very clearly and this is where if you see the fourth line it's important because it takes you back 
to what the meaning of Yasna 30.4 was. If you remember, 30.4 had told us that when the twin spirits came together, they created Gaimcha and Ajayatimcha. Now, the translation I had given you was life and what is opposed to life. And what is opposed to life is destruction, death. That idea you get very clearly in line number four. Because line number four says, Noit debitim duz sastis ahum meresyat. The key word here is meresyat. So meresyat is the destruction of ahum, life. Line four. So what he says here is, I have now come with this revelation which is about to come and I am very clear in my mind as to what I have to tell you and because of what I have to tell you and because of what you are going to hear, hopefully never again will a wrong choice be made, never again will a person who does not teach the truth lead people astray. And most importantly, this throws light upon, as I told you, Yasna 30.4. So you can make a note here. Read along with 30.4. Because obviously what is explained here is that the expression Ajay Timsha, which is translated as not life, not very happy, really means destruction. If you come now to the second verse, Again, he refers back to the twin spirits, which were referred back, if you remember. And Mainyu, as I told you, is from the word Man. So obviously, it is something that's mental as opposed to something physical. And he tells you that these twin spirits, who in the very beginning chose a right and did not choose a right, the good spirit or the Holy Spirit now speaks to the other and tells him there is a complete cleavage between the two of us morally. And it's put in very, very emphatic, strong terms. What is said is in the third line, noit na mana, man, that is not our minds. Senga is teaching, word number 16. Noit sratavo, sratavo is understanding. So our minds, our teachings, our understanding, above all, Naida Varana, if you notice, Varana comes all the time. The choice that we have made. And then we come to the words and deeds. Uksda is words, Shyautana is deeds. Last line, Daina, our philosophies. And ultimately, our very being, our souls, Urvana. They are completely unlike each other. So, what is stressed in this verse is that there is a complete cleavage between good and evil and in every single way, whether it is in mind, whether it is in teaching, what emanates from the mind, whether it is understanding what you have followed to feed your mind before and after, so to speak, pursuant to which the choice you make is either an informed one or not. And finally, your utterances and your deeds and your complete philosophy of life, your very being, must be in accordance with what the good spirit chose and not what the evil spirit chose. So it's a very emphatic and a very beautiful verse making this complete distinction between moral choice, good and evil. And notice the opening lines are, or the opening words are at fravakshya throughout. So now he's explaining. Now, what is important about verse 3 at page 231 is that he tells us in the clearest terms, this is not something that emanates from my mind. This is a revelation from Almighty God. That is very important. And that you get from line 2. Yam moe vidva. Vidva is the knowledge of whatever I am about to tell you. Is only what Vaucha spoke, Auramazda told me. So this is very important. So when he says, I will expound, the very first thing that you should know, I would translate the word Pauruvim. Please note it. Word number five. 
Paurvim means first. So he says, the most important thing or the very first thing that you should know is what God has revealed to me. And then he says, what I am about to tell you, unless you put into practice what I tell you, this is very important again, Unless you put into practice what I tell you and unless you explain it to others so that they can put it into practice, those who do not do so, I assure you that the end of their lives will be in great unhappiness, great pain. So this verse is a very key verse to understanding what follows because it tells you that what emanates from Zoroaster is not what his mind tells him but what God spoke to him. Then we come to verse 4. And here again, what is interesting is the second line. Because he tells you that it is only through following this difficult path of truth that I have myself realized Almighty God. That's very important. So he has himself, even as a prophet, tread the path of Asha. Having done so, has realized Almighty God, who are now he describes in poetical and picturesque terms, is the father of the active mind. What is interesting here is the word active. Because the good mind is something that spurs you on to activity. So again the same concept, Vangya Ushmanangao, Varesyanto is very important, word 15 active. And then again in poetical terms, Dugeda is daughter, Pita is father. These are all again, all part of the Indo-European group and quite obvious therefore to persons who speak the modern languages of English, Hindi, Gujarati, etc. And he says therefore, Armaiti if you remember, which was the means to ultimately attaining Vahumano, which is thinking correctly and therefore progressing is all the good way and ultimately realize that whatever you do, whatever you say is all noted by the Almighty who can never be deceived because he is all prevailing. Please remember that again, the Almighty in the Gathas is Almighty in every sense, all seeing Almighty knows every, every little move of everybody and whatever you do, you cannot deceive him because ultimately he is going to judge you. Then five again. Again the opening words, Ath Fravakshya, I will explain. What again was revealed to me, this is again important because Manauth is again to speak, to explain. So what was revealed to me and what is best for Maretai Bio, which is 10, those who are born to die, that is human beings, Gayopan, Maretan, if you remember, the first man who therefore was born to die. What is best for mortals to hear? Please offer Sarosh to it and reverence to it. Sarosh is, as I told you repeatedly, your conscience, something that you hear from within. So listen from within, very important. When you do that, now come the twin concepts of who Urvatat and Ameritat, most important, central to Zoroastrian philosophy, which is who Urvatat, the expression Tat is the same as the Sanskrit word that occurs in the Upanishads continuously. The state of being, the fact that you are, Urva is the soul, your very, your very, your very basic philosophy, the, the, the very essence of you. Now if the very essence of you in a complete state of being is complete who, that is completely without flaw, it's better to describe it as in negative terms, wholeness, perfection without flaw. It is only in that state, when you have worked out everything, that deathlessness will be given to you. Amarvan, Ameretat. 
So the first mention of these two concepts comes in this greater sermon. So you are told here in the greater sermon, if you follow what I am about to tell you, it is only then that you go through this life and perhaps many other lives on different planes of existence to perfect yourself, to have the necessary suffering put on you by the Almighty so that you realize that you have gone wrong. So that ultimately your Urva becomes who? Becomes whole. And only when all of us therefore are in this state, are we fit to live as immortals, not otherwise. And then of course, the last line which is again very, very interesting and very important, that if you do deeds from the best that the mind can offer, Vangyavish Banango again, God himself will come to you. So this verse again tells you, number one, what has been revealed to me, I am about to tell you, it's the best thing for you to hear. If by your heart and soul, you give everything that you have to follow what I tell you, ultimately you will triumph because you will become who death will be removed and God himself will come close to you. Then we come to six. Again, I will explain about the greatest. Again, notice the word majistam for majestic, same English word, the greatest. Praising him who is the Lord of Wisdom. And then you are told, may he through the Holy Spirit and through Vohumana guide me ultimately to attain what is the highest, which has been told to you earlier in verse 4. Now, verse 7 is very, very interesting and very important because it says, Notice the second word, Sava. The same English word, save, is the idea, you see. So, salvation. So, whoever who has been a seeker, genuine seeker, looking for salvation, everyone, and he uses all three tenses, all these seekers from the past, in the present, and in the future, I have only this to say to you. The soul of the righteous will ultimately triumph by being immortal, ever renewed are the tribulations given by the Almighty to you so that you realize where you have gone wrong. And the last part is very clear. Be very clear these tribulations are given by God himself so that you are told that it is the Lord who through the very same Kshatra, which we found in Yathavariyo part 3, if you remember, Kshatrem Chahurai, right? This very Kshatra, the same thing that is used to help you if you help a person in need, last part of Yathavariyo. The negative aspect is, it will send you such tribulations where you have gone wrong to make you move back onto the right path. And now we come to perhaps the single most important verse of the Gathas. According to me, this is the most important verse in all these hymns. And why is it so important? Because the first thing that he speaks of is that I am humbled. Nemannahu. Nammanu. Word for. What am I humbled by? And that's why I'm singing these hymns of praise. I have been humbled by a perception of Almighty God Himself. And therefore He uses the expression Chasmaini Vyadharesha. Chasmo. Same expression. So with my mind's eye, my perception, have I perceived Almighty God Himself. And what happened when He perceived God? The holy trio 
of good thought, good word and good deed emanates immediately. Which is so central to Zoroastrianism. So he tells us, good thought, deed and word, namely following the path of Asha, have I clearly seen God himself? So let us sing hymns of praise to him. He who lives in Garodeman. So you have the concept of Garodeman, which I told you earlier. Again, it's very easy for us to understand Gavanu to sing Garo Deman Domain, the English word. So this verse, which is so central, tells us first and foremost that he has actually seen God, perceived God. Why? Because he did it through good thought, deed and word, following the path of Asha, as he is supposed to. He is completely humbled by the experience and all he can do is now sing hymns of praise to the Almighty. And then we come to verse 9. So again the same idea in verse 9 as was contained, if you remember, in Yasnaha 30.9, which is the two key words, Sviti and Enaiti, if you remember. Happiness and pain. The same thing is now echoed here in the words spencha, aspencha. You remember spenta mainyo is the spirit who chose correctly. Therefore he is good, he is holy. Aspen is the exact opposite. So he tells us, him shall I seek to propitiate together with Vahuman, who in his plan, this is again very important, this is not therefore a game of snakes and ladders. There is a full complete plan. The plan as it unfolds itself and which you will see later is that the Almighty had a choice. He could have made us puppets or he could have made us sentient beings. If you are a puppet, there is nothing that you attain, you only follow. Now he has chosen to make us all sentient beings. The only thing is, we are not all-knowing. If we were all-knowing, we'd become puppets again. So it's a circular thing. Because we are not all-knowing, we are being tested. And the moral testing continues throughout all existence until finally you are in a fit state to enjoy both God and immortality. This is what is constantly echoed through the entire Gathas. So, the whole thing is that there is this plan. The plan is that God has created you with a purpose. And the purpose is never to tread upon your judgment faculty, your varan, so to speak. You must use it for yourself. And being the creator, he only corrects you when you go wrong. This is the entire vision of the prophet. Therefore, he tells us, it's very clear here again, there is no devil, there is no evil outside moral choice, there is no devil creating unhappiness. It is all the result of wrong moral choice. So he tells us again, in this plan, he has created for us both weal and woe. He has created things that are beneficent, spend, and things that are the opposite of beneficent. Retribution in the sense of judgment ultimately so that you correct yourself, the corrective faculty. So what is therefore put against us when we are found to be wanting is not from an independent devil. It is only from God and it is used to reform you. This is a very, very important thing that comes through throughout. And this is why the Lord, through his Shatra, through the same Shatrem Chaurai, has then ordained for us something like the last part of Yatha, where you are here again occurred. Now notice the word Pashu, 21. What's a Pashu? It's an animal. Correct? So it's translated as flock. 
So it tells us again that for our human flock, we rank human. There's nothing like a human animal, therefore human flock is correct. Ultimately, what is important is service. The same thing that is there in the last part of Yathav video. The idea is to do as much as possible to advance the cause of the entire humanity, entire human flock, so that you yourself in turn get what God gives you as recompense for. And you get now more echoes of Yathav Vedyo in the next verse. Because if you remember, when we translated Yathav Vedyo, I had not told you what Vangehush Dasda Manangao, apart from saying gifts of good mind, I didn't tell you what these gifts were, if you remember. These gifts come from 45.10, very important. So please make a note. For a complete understanding of the Yathav Vedyo prayer, the second part, Vangehush Dasda Manangao, you remember, gifts, which are mental gifts of the highest order, come to him, who does good deeds, in this life for love of God. Shautanenam Aggeush Mazdaya. The gifts that will come to you are four, and all four are, are mentioned here. Tevishi. Now, Tevishi is word number 25. Uttayuiti, word number 26. And who Urvatat and Ameritat, words 20 and 21. 2021, I have already explained to you. What are Tevishi and Uttayiviti? Again, very, very important to understand. You are told that the moment you go along this path of Asha, it will be very difficult. It's like going through molten metal, you have already been told. However, if you persist, then there will be two outcomes, both mental. One is that you will get strength of character, which is Tevishi. That because you have gone through such difficulties and been tested, you get stronger and stronger in character and therefore able to do more good and able to resist more evil. Very important. And the second gift equally is equally important because Utta Yuiti basically means almost to be born again, to be renewed. So you are told that your life will take a completely different turn. If you therefore persist along this very difficult path, one byproduct is that it will give you strength of character. The other is that it will take on a meaning which is completely different and which therefore gives you everything in terms of mental satisfaction. So these are the four gifts therefore spoken of. And I hope you understood all four of them because this very, very important verse therefore tells you that two of them will happen to you here and now, two of them in the hereafter. First byproduct. Strength of character, you are able to withstand. Second byproduct, life takes on a completely different meaning. You will no longer be fascinated by all that glitters. And after you die, you are assured that as you keep progressing and as the Lord keeps through his shatra, giving you sufficient guidance through punishment, so to speak, to choose a right, ultimately, you become who and in a state fit for coexistence with everybody, which then necessarily means that death is removed. So this verse again is very, very, very important. And now, very interestingly, in 11, the faith is a very, very active faith. Not only must you do good, you must fight evil. The fight evil part now is clearly here. So it says, 
And what one very important thing, fight doesn't mean by violent means. Because you are told throughout that your snaitisha, which is the sword that is mentioned here, can never be taken out of its scabbard. The only time it is taken out is in self-defense. Which is another very interesting Gathic verse, which we'll come to later. That only when somebody actually comes to physically finish you off, or finish persons close to you off, that you pull that sword out in self-defense, not otherwise. So, what is important is that you must oppose persons like the divers, think in opposition to them, actively. Only then can you think with reverence of Almighty God. And persons, therefore, who do both, that is, Shautananam, as well as oppose the divers and their group, become everybody's friend, brother, and father. Because these are the key words used again. Urvato is friend. It will occur constantly. 24. Brata is obvious. 25. Patpita is obvious. 26. Again. So, this is where the great sermon ends. A short recap, because we have gone through it a little quickly. First, most important, it's the great sermon because persons have come from afar to listen as well. Second, and interestingly enough, God has now come to Zoroaster because of his having tread this difficult path through which you require good thoughts, good words and good deeds. He has perceived God, God has spoken to him. And what has God spoken to him about? God has spoken to him about his plan, number one. Number two, where we are headed, morally, in moral terms. And number three, most important, that everything that happens to you when you tread this difficult path is not negative. The positive is Tevishi and Utayuiti, and ultimately you are going to triumph in deathlessness and companionship with the Almighty. Now, interestingly enough, if you turn back to verse 3 for a minute, go to 33.7. Now, this is obviously an earlier hymn, which I'll quickly read. Uh, should be page 170. 170. 170. In fact, we can read 169 as well, because both these verses are in some way linked to 45.3 and 45.8, which is the most important. The earlier one is linked to 45.8, because it says clearly here that he has to fulfill his guardianship as planned by God. And to do so, what does he desire? Perception of the Almighty and communion. You got that in the last two lines of 33.6. Therefore do I desire of the vision, which is perception, and communion. So, it is this that is granted in 45.8. And equally in 33.7, next page, he exhorts the Almighty to come to him in his own person and un unmistakably. First lines, come unto me, O ye best, in your own person and unmistakably, O Lord. This is what is answered then in 45.8. So, it's an important tie-up that you see these two verses, earlier verses, where he is beseeching God to come to him. And finally, God does come to him. But why does he come to him? Because he has appointed him, number one, and number two, 
because having appointed him, he has trodden the path of Asha, so to speak, and ultimately got a vision of the Almighty. With this, we can open the floor to questions. And after this, what I propose to do is now not to go verse-wise, but to go topic-wise. So that we'll have a number of subjects which we'll deal with. And in each subject, I will put together whichever verses, therefore give you a complete picture of that subject. So that you get a good picture ultimately of what the faith is about. Yeah, any questions, please? found difficulty in this. You told us that Zoroastra, Zarathustra was already the chosen one yes. to spread the message. Yeah. Today we learn from chapter 45 that actually he uh, went along the path of truth and therefore he they got the revelation. Yes. So isn't there a... No, there's no contradiction because he is chosen by the heavenly forces. Correct. Correct? The heavenly forces have omniscience, omniscience which he didn't have. They knew he would do this anyway. Very simple. And from his point of view, he didn't have it. But from his point of view, he was told that he was appointed only after he followed this path. I hope that answers the... Yes. If we don't have too many questions, we can move on to the subjects now. So would Zoroastra follow this through many lives? Or no. How do we interpret? No. Because Zoroaster is Zoroaster. You see, many lives means there's a break with Zoroaster. Zoroaster is no longer Zoroaster in the next life. Yes. Can we proceed? Because there's a hell of a lot to cover. Huh? So I don't know how we are going to... But so far, I hope this has made reasonable sense to you all. Huh? Because otherwise, it's, this is abstract and very difficult huh? to get across. So if I haven't got across and you need explanations, please ask. No problem. Yes. I'll tell you. You see, the significance perhaps of the mind is that the mind as it exists just now is what is referred to as mind. The soul perhaps is the mind together with every inner working of it, all of which continues after death. So perhaps it's a time period difference, that the mind is something which you have here. The very thing you have here together with your basic structure all becomes your soul after death and continues as you. That is very important. Uh, one question. Yeah. We are always talking about the mind and the philosophy, but there is nothing like the power of prayer. You see, religion. prayer I will deal with as a subject. I have a separate subject dealing, and I have put together all the verses dealing with prayer. All right? So, wait a little. You will come to it perhaps in the three or four lectures down the line. Because according to me, what is much more important is certain other fundamentals, such as God, such as why Zoroaster is appointed, such as where we are going, and then we'll come to prayer a little later. And prayer, I have collated a whole lot of verses, so you get a complete picture of the importance of prayer and why you pray also. Yes. Sorry? Yes. Yes, depending on the choice you make. So the important thing is the choice is yours. Ah, exactly. The ultimate choice is always yours. It may be dictated by somebody else, but the ultimate choice is always yours. The reason for these scriptures is to be told that, look, you have chosen wrongly. Now what do you do when you choose wrongly? You require the strength of character to say, listen, I, I need to move from what I am doing now and turn. And that is exactly what is the second expression, Tevishi and Utayuiti. What is Utayuiti? Utayuiti is exactly this. Realizing that you have gone wrong and moving. Yeah. Yes. Your will may not be free, by the way. In many, many, in many ways, 
your will may not be free but ultimately in the ultimate sense it is always free because it is ultimately up to use to to to, to choose correct yes uh, is this the transitional birth from the beseeching to then the knowledge of having been spoken to in the gathas i mean following this verse would it, would he now have had all the revelations you see obviously by the time he gave the great sermon he had seen or perceived almighty god and had spoken the important thing is he had spoken and the the, the speechifying with the almighty is what is revealed so by 45 that's why 45 is a very very important chapter by itself and i thought i will you know teach it by itself because to me it's perhaps one of the most important chapters if not the most important chapter containing the most important verse number 8 most important because the essence of everything good thoughts good words good deeds where you are going heaven garo demand the fact that what he is telling you is revealed from somewhere else not by his own mind all this is there in that one verse in that little nugget which is so beautiful so 45 by itself is very important because it is clearly something that has come to him after let us put it this way the verses i gave you in 31.6 and 7 and the entire chapter before this please mark it down 44 44 is the question chapter because this is where the prophet is now questioning he doesn't know yet and it's a very long chapter and one of the very abstract abstruse verses which are very difficult to transfer i mean to translate for your just as a point of view of interest is 44.18 just turn to it for a minute at 226 you see every single him in chapter 44 begins with the words tatva peresa eresmai vaucha aura you will find the same line in every single one of them what does it mean it means if you remember the word eres erect truly true derivative meaning true so he says this do i ask thee and tell me truly o lord is this so and then he asks now one of the interesting things that he asks in verse number 18 has been translated it gives great difficulty to all translators and everybody has given his own thing including tara parva now here he has pulled out something from the katha upanishad and then said that the thing that is spoken of here is not mares and camels etc the old agricultural community it is in fact meant to be something completely different if you translate it exactly as it stands i find no difficult so let's read it page 226 you see the reason in fact why and why this verse is very important please note it why it is very important from an academic study point of view is this the reason why i told you earlier the gathas are relevant today is because they are abstract they are timeless in that sense whatever is stated are universal truths which are timeless truths that's why they'll continue through the ages now the moment you try and tie them down with things like this you come into great difficulty fortunately for us verses like this are very few you will find somebody called bendwa referred to must have been some bandit king grema some evil chap again you will find king vistas who he converted you will find his ministers frashostra the vogva brothers frashostra and jamas you will find medya manga his own cousin but fortunately for us they are only one word in a verse the rest of the verse again is some moral teaching of a universal truth so you are not tied down to these people and what was happening at the time this is one this gives this one verse gives you the glimpse of how rudimentary their community was at the time that zoroaster lived and what he asked for from god very interesting because if you translate this literally 
Then the key words are aspa. We have aspi among us. What is aspi? What is asp? A horse. Ashwa. Same as the Sanskrit word ashwa. What is ustrem? Same as the last part of zarat ustra. Zarat ustra is what? A shining or golden camel. Old, ancient agricultural community. So we have horses and camels in this verse. Together with one mare. All right. Now, he tells God, look, why don't you give me physical possessions? This is how I read it. So that I can better explain to persons. Now, why is he saying this? Because he feels the need to be a reasonably well-to-do person. Otherwise, people would treat you as a vagabond. This is how I read the verse. So this is why he's saying, you know, he's not a person who's materially inclined at all. But he's saying, please give me property. And property is wealth in that old agricultural community. And what is the wealth? Das aspa. So give me ten horses. Give me a camel. Give me a mare. So that I become a man of property. And if I'm a man of property, only then will persons listen to me and get on to the right path. Because the very next words are, how will I teach them about Urvata and Amerita? He doesn't want it for himself. He wants to teach them the correct path, but he finds that he is in great difficulty. And if you read this along with 46.2, it becomes crystal clear, according to me. Now see 46.2. Again, he is saying the same thing. He is telling God, I am helpless. And why am I helpless? Because of my small possessions. You read it together, it makes complete sense. Then you don't need to get into all the esoterics of the Kartha Upanishad. No, they are spaced out in terms of meter. That's all. That's all. You see, so the Aunavad Gatha is described as such because it follows a particular meter. The Ustavad follows a completely different meter. So all the hymns that follow one particular meter are bunched together. The hymns that follow another meter are bunched together. And like that, you have five. Not at all. It's scattered all over the place. And how is the bunching being done? By who? When? Nobody knows. Perhaps by priests down the line. I don't know. Certainly not by Zoroaster himself. And there is, there is some method to the bunching, apart from meter. You'll see. Now, why are all the questions put together? The questions must have been all over the shop. Maybe 30, 30, what I read to you, 30, 31.6 and 7, were just before the verses where I'm asking and now I've got. Maybe. We don't know. But then they are in different meters again. And the different meter seems to suggest an earlier period and a later period also. The Ustavad Gatha, according to me, the second, appears to be the Gatha where Zoroaster is certainly speaking. Because there is no miracle in it, there is no nothing in it. There are earnest questions asked by a seeker. If you see 44, he is asking all sorts of questions. Some of them may sound strange to us today in this, you know, with, given this gap of time. For, for example, you find the word star there, exactly as it is. The English word star says, who made the moon, wax and wane? Who created the stars? One other interesting thing is, what is a star in modern day Hindi? A tar, tara. The word S goes. This has happened linguistically down the line in so many instances. The same word star comes down, but S goes somehow. And then it becomes tar. So interestingly enough, he is asking all sorts of what may appear to us to be rudimentary questions. Life was very rudimentary those days. But ultimately, the answers that he gives us are timeless. That is the important. So, if you now see 46.2, of course, we have digressed, but this is important. Since you ask questions, it is important you know, to come to it immediately. 46.2 tells, is, is again exhorting God and saying, listen, why am I helpless? Obviously, it's because of my lack of... Now, again, interesting, see the Avesta word. 
कम ना श्विया एट एंड नाइन कम कम सेम वर्ड यर ओछा सो आई हैव वेरी फ्यू पोजेशन एंड दैट्स वाई आई अपियर टू बी विथ सच अ स्मॉल फॉलोइंग विथ डेट क्लियर therefore give me those possessions when you read them together makes perfect sense so that that's right now you don't need to get into all these esoterics that tarapar wala got into according to me mind led by this and that and you know it's very clear it's very simple there is no allegorical stuff here he means exactly what he says give me these horses this mare and this camel they are possessions of those days now come back to the very first most important subject the nature of god what is god and here i have bunched together for myself a whole number of hymns so that you get a very clear concept of what the prophet tells you are the nature or attributes of almighty god first most important thing for those who didn't attend earlier god is in two parts ahura and mazda ahura is the same as asura asura is a dirty word today in the rigveda it it was a higher word than dev and it meant lord and it went along with mitra and varun who were the two great upholders of the moral order in the rigveda so what is interesting is that zorasta having emanated out of the rigveda he describes himself as a zotar an agnihotri a fire priest having emanated out of it throws all these ancient gods and human beings nature and human beings over says i have got this one god now who i will call by the same first name because anyway it went with the two great upholders of the moral order the idea of morality so i will still call him asura or ahura but i will coin a new expression to describe him because he is the he is he is being described by me for the first time which is mazda maz english word majestic great da creator so you have this lord now who is thrown over everybody else and supplants everybody else who is not only the upholder of the moral order but is the be all and end all of everything you will find one very beautiful verse where he says that not only is he the youngest he is also or the first he is also the last in my mind which shows be all and end all of everything now the very first verse on these attributes of god is yasna 28.9 so i want you to bunch all these verses together and later go home and read them for yourselves so that you get a clear picture of what aura mazda is according to the prophet now 28.9 you will find at page 101 the pages are all at the bottom and two very interesting things are stated here apropos of what cyrus asked me one is that he is most worthy to be invoked in prayer number 1 and two never provoke the almighty to wrath because if you provoke the almighty to wrath his hand will fall heavily upon you so that you move again towards the right path now both these concepts are very beautifully brought out here i'll quickly just read through it never o ahura mazda de through these thy blessings may we provoke to wrath this is the idea of the verse nor asha or vohumano etc but we eagerly strive to offer our hymns of praise to you you who are the most worthy to be invoked most important word is word 20 zevista yango 
most worthy to be invoked. No, only by following the wrong path. No. Now, the, the wrong path consists of bad words, bad thoughts, which may translate themselves into bad words and which certainly translate themselves into bad deeds. So, two beautiful concepts here. One, don't ever provoke the Almighty to wrath because it will come down on you. And second, the most worthy being to be invoked in prayer. So these are two concepts which come from here. Now go on to 29.6 and keep noting these because all these have to be bunched together. 6, page 109. Now, one interesting thing about this chapter, 29. Read the chapter for yourselves at home. Because this is the conference in heaven that takes place to appoint Zoroaster. And interestingly, in this verse, you will find both Ahu and Ratu mentioned. You remember the first part of Yatha Huverio? Just as an Ahu is all powerful, a Lord. So is a Ratu, but because he's followed the path of Asha. And why does Zoraster call himself a Ratu? He's an appointed Ratu, appointed under this chapter. Because the earth is wailing. What is interesting also from a comparative religion point of view is that the Bhagavat Puran in chapter 10 has exactly the same thing in the form of a cow, Gauss. Here, this is Gauss. So, Gauss Urvan. That is the soul of the agricultural community, wailing away, saying that there is rapine, etc. Why don't you appoint somebody to save us and help us? And Zoroaster is appointed. There again, the same thing. The soul of a wailing cow, exactly the same, which is why then Lord Krishna was appointed. Now, you have exactly the same imagery. And Gaussurvan doesn't mean a cow. It means... And when you are talking, don't forget of Gauss, Urvan, not by itself. Urvan means soul. So you are talking about the collective wisdom or the collective of the agricultural community itself. All of them are crying and saying, listen, there is hell going on here. Moral hell. Why don't you help us and send down somebody? Now, in this chapter, therefore, you have verse 6, where again, a very interesting concept of God is given. In the second line, thereupon speak out Aura Mazda, enlivening life's web with all pervading life. So one other very interesting attribute of Almighty God is all pervading. He is everythingness, something we can't conceive of. And here of course the Lord in this verse is basically, this is just to digress, because this has nothing to do with the attribute of God, which is already gone. But here, what is happening is, he first turns to Asha, which is the embodiment of truth, Archangel, and says, I have appointed you to look after what's happening on earth morally, what are you doing? So Asha replies and says, I have found nobody. So in disgust, the Almighty turns to Vaumana, who is the next great Archangel. That archangel furnishes an answer and says, yes, all right, I have got hold of one person, he is Zarthustra, and we will send him. After which, the agricultural community bewails and bewones and says, what are you doing? You are sending us some, and they use the word cowardly. Some cowardly human being to try and save us? Where is the question of his saving us? Ultimately, however, and that's how the last verse then comes in, obviously he's fulfilled his mission which must have been a very, very difficult mission to fulfill because he, nothing short of revolution. And he seems to have attained it and then therefore they thank God. In, thank God in the last verse for sending it. Now we come to verse 31.8. Again a very interesting verse. For yet another attribute, 133.
पेज वन थ्री थ्री All of you got it. Here again, the key words. Please mark, under underline them or circle them. It will be easy. Number four and number six. Pauruvim and Yazum. Because literally they mean the first and the last. Pauruvim you've already seen. Pauruvim means first. So, Zoroaster is saying, "May I perceive you as being the be-all and end-all of everything, first and the last." And this is the verse which has to be read with forty-five point eight, the most important verse, because he is asking here, "Can I behold you? Can I completely perceive you in my eye?" You remember, chasmaini vyadare sam there. You are same word, chasmaini. Fifteen, number fifteen, and the word grabem. May I grab you, if you want to use an English word. As the true creator of truths and the judge supreme over the actions of all the living. so here again two other attributes of god most important is judge supreme over the actions of all the living and the second is everythingness first and last so here please write read with 45.8 the same word chasmaini occur, occurs in both this is where he is asking to behold there is very telling you yes i have i have got behold and god then we come to 31.1313 this is again beautiful because it tells you how rational the almighty is he doesn't like strict and horrible penances for small sins <laughs> another very interesting verse thirty one point thirteen here the key lines are lines three and four ye va kaseus ainango now where did ainango occur earlier in your kasti prayer kemna mazda mavaite payum darat yatma dregva didrashta ainange 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 correct now how was it translated when we read the kemna mazda prayer if you remember turn to 46.7 page 246 it is word number 11 ainange violence correct so for doing a small violence kaseos is small you can't have a majesta majista majestic big bujem penance it's so clear when you get the avestan words themselves conceptually things become very clear yeah and this is not punishment as much as penance it's very important so what he is trying to tell you is there are a lot of people who are trying to mortify themselves through penances punishment is what is imposed by an outside authority penance is something you do yourself so he's telling you don't mortify yourself for little things it doesn't take anybody anywhere only continue to do good and fight evil the first 
Sorry. Yeah. No, she is who? She is Armaiti. Is it? Because that's clear from the earlier verse, I think. You just see the earlier verse, bottom. Last two lines. Through his spirit, Armaiti, who is regarded as feminine, maybe. Maybe, you see, the gender is only given in these ancient languages, depending. It doesn't mean he or she. It's like French, you know. English is genderless. You can say le and la for things that are inanimate. They don't mean anything. So it's like le or la. So it says, when Armaiti is standing by whenever she, there is a doubt, when in open doubts or when in secret ones, she discourages Armaiti. Armaiti is your thinking faculty. Where is the attribute of God in this passage? I'm sorry? of God in this paragraph. Very important. It is not attribute as much as the fact that God frowns upon. Uh, you see, you have in most verses attributes. Then there are other things which the Lord specifically does not like. This falls into that group. What does he frown upon? He frowns upon unnecessary penance for something small. Doesn't take you anywhere. Then we come to 48.9, read with 32.16, put them together. We first come to 48.9, page 273, to be read with 32.16. Page 273. Hmm? Here the prophet is asking, when shall I be sure if in fact you rule over everybody? And even those whose plots are a menace to us. It says, let the pattern of Omano be revealed truly unto me. The Saviour should know how his blessing shall flow. Very important. This is the first time he calls himself a Soshyat. The expression Socios you will get as word 19, 1, 9. Otherwise he describes himself as a Ratu. Yes. So you get the distinction. You see, a Ratu is only a person who is strong in character etc. because he has lived by the path of truth. A socios is something much higher. He is actually a person who is sent by God as a saviour. And if you remember, according to later Zoroastrianism at least, there are three saviours who will be born at different times. The Farwandin Yash tells us this. Each one is a time of great trouble, like the time Zarathustra was born. In. And when there is this tremendous trouble, you will have three persons and they are named. Astvat Ereta, Ukshyat Ereta and Socios. Socios will come at the end of time. That is just before the cutoff, Judgment Day and the Resurrection. The other two will come after Zoroaster. And what do they mean? Ereta you already know, English word erect. Correct? So what is Astvat and what is Ukshyat? Because these are the two words that go with them. Astvat is a person who brings back the reign of truth. So things have gone so far out of gear that Astvat Ereta will come to bring back Ereta to everybody. Ukshya Ereta comes in a time which is not that bad. Because what he will do is he will make truth wax. Ukshya means wax as opposed to wind. The same word is used in the prashna or the, the, the question chapter. What, O oh Lord, makes the moon wax and wane? Ukshyat is used for waxing. 
So in the sense of making greater, distributing greater. So the three socians that are supposed to be born are supposed to be born in times of trouble. We don't know who the socians are except to say that Jesus is perhaps one of them. Why? Because the Farvandin Yasht specifically uses an expression which is translated as either a very young woman or as a virgin. Now, a very young woman by itself would be meaningless. You could be an old woman, young woman, unless, of course, you are the mother of Isaac, like in the Bible. Because Sarah was so old, she was way beyond childbearing. And the Lord said, you, you will bear a child. So both of them laughed. Because they laughed, he said, I will call him Isaac, which means laughter. See? So unless it is something which is like Sarah, which is, you would say old woman only when you intend to say that you are beyond the age of childbearing. Why would you say young woman? Before childbearing. Therefore, there is something miraculous attached. So, Jesus certainly appears to be one of them. And predicted in the Farvandin Yasht, which is, dates back to about 1000 BC. That would take us before Isaiah. Isaiah is about 800. So, not at all. On the contrary, it is Zoroastrianism that triumphs because three Zoroastrian priests, according to the Gospel of St. Matthew, they are called Magi. They are not wise men. They are Magoi. They are Magi. They are only Zoroastrian priests. They are master astrologers who follow a star and bless Jesus as being one of the socials. Where did they get this from? Yeah. The depiction is a 9th century one. And they are called with 9th century names because nobody knows what their names were. Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar. They have nothing to do with Persian name, they are all wrong. Because by the time of the James Bible again, which is much, much later, the Greek was mistranslated into wise men in English. The Greek is Magoi, very clear. The Greek version of the old Bible is that three Magi came down and followed. Yes, they are believed to have been buried in Cologne Cathedral. Again. <laughs> yes, perhaps. No. Because none, you see, all have to be born of a virgin. That, that is common to all of them. A virgin. A young woman. It's either you translate it as a young woman or virgin. That is very... Now, whether Buddha is born, not born, again is a big question mark because Jatak stories tell you that Mayavati, that is his mother, had this dream and a white elephant entered. The white elephant may be the Holy Spirit. Like Christ's dad is the Holy Spirit. Spetta Mainu. And the Holy Spirit enters and as, the, as a result of the Holy Spirit entering, she gives birth. And she is a vessel because in eight days she dies. Buddha's mother. But this is now detracting too far. We have to come back to. You know. So where was I? I was at 48.9, correct? Yes. Yes, exactly. Now 48.9 says, When will I be sure if you in fact rule over everybody? And what I had stressed was, that he says, look, you have appointed me. Now I know that I am appointed as a saviour. But I must also know whether ultimately you are going to be the supreme judge over everybody and see to it that everybody chooses a right. When will I know this? The answer is given in 32.16. Page 163. In the, sec in the third and fourth lines, Shayas Mazda Ura Yaya Ma Aithis Chit Dvaita. Direct answer. You do have power. Shayas is the same as Shatra. Ah, over those, even over those whose plans are a great menace to us. So, 
so you will indeed rule over all. All right. Now come to 34.7. Yeah. This is a very, very important verse from two points of view. Page 184. The last two lines of this verse are a strict monotheism. They are very important because it says, I do not acknowledge anybody other than you. This is the great reform, you see, throw over of everybody else. Naichim, nobody. Do I acknowledge other than you, Yusmat? And Vaida is, do I acknowledge? So therefore, through your Asha, please shelter, protect us. This verse is a very, very important verse from the point of view of critics who have said that this faith may not be monotheistic. Mazdas cha urana, if you remember. In plural, when we dealt with that. This is the answer here. Number one. And number two, equally important, That the moment you are in terrible trouble on earth, the only way to get, up, get out of it is to think of what is going to come in the hereafter, your true inheritance. This is again a very beautiful verse. And it answers many questions that are asked. Why is somebody suffering just now? Why is somebody... Because this is only a small test period. The life to come is much more important. So it says, whenever you have trouble, the word Sadra, 13. See, word number 13. And you are being threatening, threatened by persons who are a spin. Word number 11. Not good. Evil people. Literally, chaksreyo usi uri means make the intellect free. Now, it makes no sense unless you translate it as frees you from these troubles because you know what your true inheritance is going to be. And your true inheritance is the life you are after. Can you explain that again? I'm sorry? Can you explain that again? Yes. You see, this verse is very important because not only does it enforce strict monotheism, which you saw from the second last line, it is even more important in what it says in the first four lines because it says that when you are in, time, in times of trouble, in distress, and when evil people are attacking you in any way, Always think, don't go down in the dumps. Always think of what is going to come to you in the year after. What is your true inheritance? Your true inheritance is Urvatat and Ameritat. So, in times of trouble, whenever somebody attacks you, whenever there is difficulty and you have to go down in the dumps, pick yourself up with the thought that ultimately everything will be all right. Very important words. Yes. Again, would be those who have uh, made the wrong choice, not evil by itself, because they have no, see, chosen the wrong You one. may be in distress because of any reason. Nothing about choice. But Aspen are persons who have made the wrong choice. You get the distinction. A person is Aspen, that means he is the opposite of bountiful, good, etc. Spenta minu. A spen is somebody who opposes those who are spent. Yeah. So, a spen, yes. But when you are in distress, you may be in distress for whatever reason. 
There are million reasons which distress you on earth constantly. One may be your wife in the morning, for example. Because there are 20 guests coming at night. Yes. No, I'm just giving you an example. I'm just giving you an example. I didn't expect an immediate return, but never mind. I'm not looking at you. And maybe, maybe, maybe anything else as well. But what is important is, it drew the necessary response immediately. <laughs> number one. And number two, what is important is that you may be in difficulty in a million ways. Think of what is going, because ultimately, there is, this is, you know, in fact, I, what I can recall and give you is this beautiful uh, statement on the Bulan Darwaza in uh, Fatehpur Sikri. I don't know if all, you all have seen it. You must have seen that person jump into a little well and so on. Now, on that massive darwaza, Akbar was taken up with a very beautiful saying of Jesus. The saying is not in the Bible. So it is obviously from some other tradition. And the saying is, Jesus, Isa, peace be upon him, said, do not build houses upon this earth, but try and go perceive what the next world is going to be. For this earth is but a moment, the rest is unseen. Beautiful. This is trying to capture that kind of thought. This earth is but a moment. The rest to you just now is unseen, but it will come. So, if, if you know, you marry this with that beautiful saying, it brings the thought out, I think, very well. So, this is 34.7. Now, come to 43.3. Page 195. One other important attribute. God dwells in many worlds which are real. Now this is very important because this again is an indirect assault on reincarnation. You see, the Lord dwells in many, many, many planets, places, planes of existence. And that you find in the English translation in line 4 and 5 leading up to the worlds of truth where Ahura dwells. Why worlds of truth? Because they are in fact real. As opposed to Drujo Deman. If you remember, you had Garo Deman and Drujo Deman. Drujo means the world of the lie. It is false. It exists only for the purpose of reformation. And will go when reformation is not necessary. So this is one more interesting attribute. And again you are told in verses 5 and 6, page 197-198, that the ultimate goal, where all the worlds of life advance to, is to Almighty God. Again, same thing, same concept. Incidentally, verse number 5 at page 197 is very important from the, from the point of view those of, of those who have constantly asked me about karma. See, you are told unmistakably that the Lord has ordained that all acts and all words shall bear fruit. That's not important in the present context, but it happens to be here. And if you turn to 6, at page 198, this is the goal towards which all creation proceeds to. And all worlds of life advance. Important words here are 14 and 16. 
Gaitha and Fradante. Now come to the questions chapter, 44. Ever. Oh yes, it will come, okay. it will come. Very much so, the word is sha, f, 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 s, v, a, sha, it will come. Thank you. And in fact, even though the very verse which I am coming to speaks of a lover as translated by Tara Porwala, it doesn't really mean lover, it means a friend. But we'll come to love separately. Uh, page 209. Now here the prophet is asking, Tattva Peresa Eresmai Vauchaura, the same formula in every single verse if you remember. First thing is nemanno, nammanu, humility, number eight. And the question here is of what sort of worship, what kind of worship would your devotee give to you? Point this out to me, O God, who is a friend to you, very important. The Greek word is freya, which is number 14. Taraporwala translates it as lover. It doesn't fit in other contexts. Fraye is the same root as the English word friend. So very interestingly enough, he's asking God, what, by what means should one worship you? Please tell me who I am your friend. So worship in the sense of a person who is friendly, not frightened of, not, you know. And does the Lord answer? Huh? Yes, Lord answers. And he answers, let us take you straight to the answer in, I think, 34.4. Uh, page 181. Because he tells him that you worship me through fire, which is the embodiment of Asha, which is the embodiment of truth. And you'll get that concept right at the beginning also. Just give you the verse. Just give me a minute. Sorry? Inner fire. No, it's not here. Atar is fire. You can translate it as whatever you like, but context may mean inner fire also, but here it is fire. I'll give you the other verse a little later. But this is the verse which speaks of... Yeah. Uh, 34.4. For thy fire, O Aura, mighty through Asha, because the, con the link is with truth. Do we yearn earnestly to be desired, possessing power, giving clear help to the faithful constantly. Why? Because you are moving along its path. But O Mazda, as regards the unfaithful, sees through the evil at the merest glance. Now, interestingly enough, the word Zasta, number 17, 1, 7, really means hand. Hand. Ista is his turn off. So with a turn of the hand, 
so to speak, like this. He sees through it. Now we come to uh, verse 3 of 44. These are all questions being asked. He asks him, are you the father of Asha? Have you set the path of the sun and the stars? Is it you who makes the moon wax and wane? 211. Just read it for yourself. Nothing much turns on it, but... He's asking various questions, saying, Who is the creator? The first father of Asha. Interestingly enough, who laid down the path of the sun and the stars? The path otherwise in ancient times was an antithetical because it was supposed to be fixed. Here he seems to know that there was a path, is moving along with the stars. And notice the word starim, same word, 1-7. Sveng is son, 16. And the same word that I told you, if you remember, Ukshyeti, Narevseti. Ukshyeti, 24. Wax, as opposed to vain. Ukshyat Ereta. Similarly, verses 4, 5, 6 and 7, I won't read them. But one very interesting concept occurs throughout, which is when he talks of the earth, it is joyful and brings joy to mankind. Very important. That you find in words 25 and 26 in 44.6 at page 214. You will always find these words throughout the Gathas occurring together. Ranyo skeretim gam tasho. Gam is like gam, aprogam, village, earth. And this earth is described in two ways. One is that it brings joy all the time. Uh, 214, page 214. Last Avestan line. Kaibyo Azim Ranyo Skeretim Gam Tasho. You will find this occur throughout Ranyo Skeretim, number one, together with earth. And the other word you will find together with it is Azya, which means pregnant, literally, but which means bountiful here, when it goes with earth. Azya. A Z Y A. Y A. So Azia means bountiful. So Mother Earth is both joy giving and bountiful. No, Azia. That will that'll occur in other verses. Yes. Azia. Just note it for the time being. We have already read the second sermon, so I am only giving you the verses again. In the context of God, 45.4, if you remember, God is all prevailing, never deceived. Two attributes. We have already dealt with it just now, in the morning. 45.4. Then 45.6, again, Lord of Wisdom, greatest of all. 45.4 first, then 45.6. Reason I am not reading is, is because we have dealt with it in the morning. And then 45.10. Lord of creation, Lord of life.
Sorry? Three verses from what we've done this morning. Four, six, ten. In four, God is all prevailing and never deceived. In six, he is the Lord of wisdom and the greatest of all. In ten, Lord of creation and life. Then, sorry? No, no, not at all. There is no trinity here. God is one and without a second. Therefore, the importance of the monotheistic verse. To answer your question, I do not worship anybody other than thee. You remember, which was the monotheistic verse which I just read? 34.7. Will you turn to it? Yes. Second last line. Second last line. Naichim tem aniem yusmat vaida. None else other than you do I recognize. Spenta Mainyu, who is the Holy Spirit in the Trinity, in Christianity, is only a creation of God. Nowhere near God. Yes. Yes. Yes, he creates everything and everything emanates from him. Yes. Yes. No. God is everything, if you remember, all pervading, again. So God and his creation are not different. He is everythingness. Yes. If you want, analytically, they are different aspects, yes. And now we come to the judge aspect again, in 46.9. Two more verses and we are done. 46.9248, page 248. Yeah. I'll just read it. Who is the great one, the foremost devotee who shall teach me? How do we regard thee as most worthy to be invoked? As holy judge of our acts, Lord of truth. All right? And one more last verse, 51.3. Page 302. 302. Again a verse which you can put down as something which speaks of revelation. Line number 3. God is truth tongued through his teachings about woman. Of these, O oh God, from the very beginning, you have been teacher. Any difficulty in following this verse? No. Okay. I'm sorry? Uh, you take it further only by saying that this verse, like the other verse which I read, if you remember, in chapter 45, saying, look, I am not telling you what I think, something revealed from Almighty God. Similarly, here he is telling you, God's teachings about Vahumano, etc., which are coming through me, are all revelatory. And God alone has been the teacher, teacher of Asha, Vahumana, etc., of the, all the concepts and theory from the very beginning. How does this answer this question of the, being the, who is the judge? It doesn't. It has nothing to do with judge. It's a separate verse and this is all under the rubric of either attributes of God or 
God's liking you to do something, not liking you to do something, etc. All the verses dealing generally with God. So this deals with another completely different aspect of God. Does and tells answer. you very clearly that it is God who is teaching you all this through Zorest. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? I'd much rather you all go and work, huh? Because there's a lot of work to be done now. This is... Uh, just reread everything I have told you. Reread it for yourself and try and make your own little notes. What thoughts occur to you? You see, different thoughts will occur to each one of you. Yes. Can we start formulating a vocabulary of often used words? Yes. You know, it, it, it would help to do that because now I've written a whole heap of notes, but to pull out the words like you keep saying, we've come across this, we've come across this. If we could kind of formulate a vocabulary, it would help all of us because then we'll just refer to that uh, we'll try tabulation. And do it, no. No. It's so, no. So that's what you I see, mean. If we no could Avesta start dictionary. this, it would help a lot. Rigvedic dictionary through which you can do it, yes. Yeah. That's again very difficult. You know, I, I also want to ask that what is the equivalent of Asha? You know, Asha is a word that is repeated so often, Correct. right? Yet it's not a word that is in our Gujarati or name common parlance. Yes. Why do you suppose that is? I mean, because is, is it associated too much with a Hindu no, uh, connotation? No, no. Because we don't use Asha or Asha is not a name that, and actually it would be a wonderful name that could be used in, in common parlance, not in, in Parsi names. Maybe, but see, Asha or Asha, even it is not Asha. Asha. There's a big yeah. difference. This so, is, it Asha. Oh, uh, Asha. Asha. Which means something very different from Asha. Hmm. So, Asha. Asha, yeah. The equivalent word is Iretta, as I've told you constantly. Right. So, the English word erect comes directly. Why? Because it's in Old English. Right. See, old English right. was nothing but. Old German. Which pre, is old Sanskrit. Pre, yes, pre 1066, pre the conquest, before Norman okay, words came in. Yeah. The Angles and the Saxons came and inhabited the island. They came from Germany. And they carried the German language with them, which was Old English. So if you go to a thesaurus and you find out which word comes from Old English, you will definitely find a Sanskrit root. Because German in turn goes back to Sanskrit. And Sanskrit in turn goes back to Avesta. I'm sorry? Yes, of course. So this is how the Indo-European group, and it is, as I told you earlier, Sir William Jones, who we have to thank. Nobody knew this until the late 18th century, when this great man came down as a very young man, and was a judge in Calcutta. So he, I know what it is to be a judge now. Four and a half hours is, is very difficult huh, to concentrate. You have to read three hours before that, three hours after that. Completely concentrated. And apart from this, this man did work on linguistics in his spare time. He knew 27 languages. And because he was a genius, it is he who was able to correlate certain words. And the more basic the word, the more certain it would be that it would be common to all. Ma, father, you know, things like create, things like demand. So it is this man who suddenly realized that, look, all the languages we are familiar with in the Western world, whether it be English, whether it be Greek, whether it be Latin, all seem to have some correlation with ancient Sanskrit. And when he translated Kalidas's Shakuntala into English, it is at that point that he got the maximum words and realized that even Old English is a daughter of Sanskrit. And it is thanks to him really that we have come to know our Gathas. Because without this, nobody would have realized, German scholars wouldn't have known that the Rigvedic language and this language were sisters. And then when you actually sit down and you compare them, they are exact sisters. 
which is why fortunately rigvedic sanskrit has remained through its priests here and the priests have told us what it means avesta was long dead in persia by the time adarbad marasban came and formulated the kasti prayer in the 4th century it was dead which is why if you remember i told you we perhaps know the translation of the gathas far better today than any of our forebears for thousands of years yes anything else thank you